Welcome to Civilnet. My guest today is a photojournalist Gilad Sadeh. He's from Israel and he's currently in Stepanakert in Nagorno-Karabakh covering the ongoing war. Thank you, Gilad, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, so you have spent several days in the area and you've been documenti documenting through images and stories uh, the aftermath of the war. Um, what is your insight of the situation there? So actually I'm here since uh, very few days after the beginning, uh, um, over two weeks already. And for me as someone that actually worked in the region for a long time and document the life in uh, Karabakh for over five years, it is a very hard to see the situation, to see the peaceful city and the villages that I've been before just um, empty and most of the people left. Uh, houses that destroyed, it is very hard, you know, because the place before, as I know, was very nice and peaceful, and right now it is a war zone. Okay, um, so if we have to, to talk about more the relations between Armenia and Israel, I know, we know that the situation, the relation between the two countries is pretty tense because uh, there is the issue of uh, cluster bombs in Azerbaijan, according to Amnesty International. The Armenian government and Karabakh government is using uh, cluster bombs, which is banned under the Convention on Cluster Bombs. And experts of um, Amnesty International reveal that these munitions came from Israel, and Israel uh, is arguing that uh, there is no use of um, there is, no, there is a lack of evidence to justify a hearing on whether they, the, the, the arms are used uh, for a war crimes against Armenia. You have been on the ground and you're on the ground. And as a journalist, I guess you have noticed yourself. Have you noticed themselves those cluster bombs? And in this case, what would you say about Israel's involvement in this conflict? So right now, as I'm here, I'm just documented, do documenting whatever I see. If it's a use of uh, um, rockets or missiles, cluster bombs, whatever, uh, I'm not an expert of weapons. I can just document what I see here. If there is a use of Israeli cluster bombs here, it is very sad. But at the moment from here, it is hard for me to just, you know, clarify such information. I'm here just to show what is really going on inside. And for the people here, yes, when you see a building that hit by a cluster bomb, this is a very bad, uh, it's a bad feeling to see that, it's a bad feeling to talk with the people, and I hope that it is not an Israeli, but there is a chance that yes. Um, so, you know, um, Armenians always felt close to uh, the Israeli people because of the shared experience of genocide, and um, the Armenian genocide committed in 1915 by Ottoman Turkey and the 1945 Holocaust against Jews by Germany. Um, but of course, I guess, you, obviously, as you said, you're not a politician, you're not a political expert, you're not a military expert. However, what do you think about the, of the support of the Israeli government to Azerbaijan? Is it an indicative that for states, uh, not only Israel, but in general, that for states, profit counts more than human lives and ethnic cleansing more uh, than values and morality? So, first of all, um, the connection between Armenians and Jews is not only about uh, the shared history. Uh, of course, there is a feeling of a close relation sometimes when you meet people and they can understand what is uh, being, you know, the under threat for your entire life and um, also the border situation in Israel and the border situation in Armenia is very similar. Living under threat is, is a very problematic situation and going up like that make people sometimes, you know, feel more connected with people that share the same experience. But uh, as for the connection uh, with Israel and Azerbaijan, uh, there is a lack of, of information in Israel. Many people think that Armenians have a problem with Israel, that Armenia support Iran against Israel, uh, but that's just because they never visited Armenia or Artsakh. Um, the, the connection of Armenia and Israel 
supposed to be better, supposed to be uh, stronger, but um, the lack of oil, I guess, make Israel connected more. Uh, the lack of oil in Armenia make Israel connected more with Azerbaijan because Israel used about uh, 60 or 70 percent of the uh, oil in Israel is coming from Azerbaijan. So, you know, it's, it's not about the shared experience. It's only about um, power and money. And this is, uh, this is very sad because at the end, people in Israel think that Armenians hate us. Uh, but they don't know that Armenians really love us. And even now, when I'm here during the war and there are these talks of uh, using use of Israeli weapons in the war, people still welcoming me. Um, I know there is like a bit more tense uh, conversation with people sometimes, but most of people still have no problem with me being Israeli. They just ask me, maybe you can make a change in your country. And I hope it's possible, but at the end, we, not only, we are not only sharing history, um, we are sharing a lot of, diff, uh, a lot of uh, culture issues, you know, if it's hospitality and stuff like that. So um, maybe we need to develop more tourism here from Israel and that will help the situation to be better. So let's talk more about your work, your job on the ground. And I wanted to ask you that, um, so you, you documented uh, via through images and I said uh, pictures uh, and also short stories, uh, captions uh, with your images. Uh, what is the most striking experience or memory that you have uh, those several days you spent in Karabakh? I think one of the most powerful moments um, was on the very one of the very first nights when I heard a very strong explosion, very loud one, very close to me, and I just left. It was in the middle of the night, and I stopped the car uh, with a few guys to just look for where is the house to see if someone is inside, and. You know, we we drive around the city until we found the house and they run inside. Nobody been inside, but until the moment that there is the realization of empty house, the, the feeling was so scary because you don't know what you will find inside. You don't know if it's just uh, someone that injured or someone that died, if there are babies inside or family or just old people, you don't know. And, and this is a very, very powerful moment when you realize that nobody injured. The house is damaged and you feel, okay, oh, it's just the house. Uh, it's not just the house, it's a lot of memories. It's, it is the life of people, it's the trauma they, they will carry for a long time and their neighbors will carry for a long time. Um, but I think that if I will look into the most powerful memory I have in my five years of documenting Karabakh, uh, it's the first feeling, uh, the first visit. Uh, when I came here on the first time, I believed that I'm going into a war zone, very dangerous place, that everyone here is carrying Kalachnikov, and I might be robbed. I don't know. Uh, that all was based on propaganda that was available in the internet. And once I stepped in and I crossed the border, I found so nice people and everyone stopped the car that we drove, uh, feed us with food, let us drink vodka, uh, eat honey or cheese or whatever they had on the table at the moment. And, and I just realized that this, this is a very... Um, kind place that just suffered from dehumanization for over uh, two decades back then. And understanding that there are so nice people living in the, in the situation where everyone believes that they are criminals actually made me come back again and again and again. And a bit before the war started, I almost published my photo book about Artsakh and everything escalated. And for me, you know, it was the moment of realization that maybe these five years was the most important 
project I made as a photojournalist because I could document the reality in, in this place before the war. And if someone ever will tell me, look, these people are brutal, these people are criminals, these people are separatists, I, I will never have any doubt with my uh, truth that they are just the kind people who try to survive day-to-day -day life. Uh, in your book, uh, you just talked about this project, Picture Project, your book. Will you, um, I mean, your plan was to show the peaceful part of the region and the peaceful part of uh, Karabakh and its people. Will you, but from peace now we uh, will switch to despair. Will you add this to your book, in your book? What yes, you've been experiencing? I, I, I think that. Um, I think that the war here and the life before together as uh, one story is just um, another story of, uh, of a place that people just, you know, one day woke up into a disaster just because someone else wants to have a power, just because someone else wants to um, get a cheaper um, pipelines or um, gas lines or whatever and and those people who just live their peaceful life and you know grow everything in their garden just one day woke up and maybe some of them lost everything already I know people that I document their life um, as a teenagers and they lost their life during the war of course I have to to share this because this is part of the reality here. And one of the most important, I think one of the most important uh, part of the, of the, the story is that um, my friend told me once in a village, you know, Gilad, I born in the USSR. I don't know what is the freedom. My son born in, in the free Artsakh and he will never understand what is a cage. And I think this is part of the story, the, the way that people are fighting now is a survival um, war. It's not any of, you know, gaining more power, gaining more land. It's just let's, let us live because the feeling of everyone here that I talk with is if we would, if we will lose this war, we will lose our life. And this is part of the story. Um, you know, I, I, I could see some of the people that are in the front line as a teenagers and I realized that that's one of the other things that we are very similar in Israel. We all go to, we have the, to serve in the military when we are 18 and we also lost, uh, everyone in Israel lost some family member during a war or during, you know, a terror attacks. And, and, and that's another similarity that I just realized we have right now, you know, as, as countries. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it is part of the story and, and I hope um, it will be short war because I can see the tragedy is already here and so many people already left and so many people, by the way, in both sides, they are suffering from that. Um, the families that lost, lose their children, they, they don't really, it, it doesn't matter if you are Azari or, or Armenian, you, you lose uh, someone and they will never come back. So I hope it will be, it will finish fast. And then last question, um, why do you keep staying in a war zone in a conflict zone um, it's became dangerous um, every day it's even more dangerous why do you keep staying there as um as a photojournalist or documentary filmmaker you want to capture the moment as is and if it's dangerous it's part of the work I at the risk of your life um, the, the risk, yes, in different places there are different risks and um, yes, I know that I'm here, you know, like so the other day I had a missile just 
few meters from from the place I stand, and th this is part of of being a photojournalist. You, if you want to show the truth to the world, you have to be there. You have to, you know, speak from uh, what you experience and what you see, and not from what you get from out from inside when you are outside sitting and drinking coffee in a nice uh, cafe. Um, I, I also, you know, I also do all this work. I came here, I financed my flight, I came here without knowing if I will be able to sell some of the materials and good people actually um, donated money and still donating to help me to document here. But at the end, I didn't think, okay, um, w would I be able to cover the cost of what I'm doing here or maybe I will lose my life, which is uh, more dangerous. I just came here because I believe that this situation needs to be uh, documented until the last poss moment possible. Uh, if I will see that there is no chance, but I have to leave, of course I will leave. But as long as I feel that the management of risk is kind of okay, I'm here. Okay, thank you very much, Gilad, for this talk. And uh, thank you for having me, and I hope uh, peace or uh, in the local language, Hararutsun, will come very fast. Thank you very much, Hararutsun. Thank you for uh, watching us and continue to follow CivilNet as we keep you updated on the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh.